say I, I had a suit on two days in a row. She didn't know what that was about. I usually wear a suit every day. All right, are we on? We're on. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Praise the Lord. We're on the radio. All right, hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. Glad to be in the service one more time. And I assume we're on uh, social media as well. So, if I'm talking to Northeast Ohio, then I must start by saying, go Guardians. Lord have mercy. Go to the Guardians. And we even have a little, uh, we've got our own little angel thing too now. What they did. Did you see that last night, Leroy, where they were doing the thing with their arms? I said, look at the, the guardians go. So uh, I, had, I, I thought I had given up on them. I had to drop my son off and his friends, and I was driving through downtown, and I saw people literally walking over the bridge. They gave up, too. They, they were on their way home, and I got about halfway down the freeway, and I heard fireworks. And I said, what is that about? They don't play fireworks when they shoot fireworks when they lose and I didn't think any more of it and my son called he said dad they won they won I said wow so go guardians go guardians Lord have mercy that's a great thing Cleveland needs a win and uh, and and Lord knows if you are a real Clevelander you have a certain uh, bad taste in your mouth when it comes to them Yankees, but it's all right. It's all right. Those Yankees, uh, they took a whooping last night, and it was a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. So I'm fired up. I'm fired up. I have the opening day towel. I went to opening day because they changed their name, thank God, and I said on opening day that they were going to the World Series, and it looks like they're trying to do it. Amen. And I have a Guardians jersey, and a, a cap with a C on it. I've never had those things in my life, but I am full go guardians, full go. Amen. All right. As if that has anything to do with Jesus. Um, the text this morning for Sunday school is Acts, the seventh chapter, verses 51 through 60, and then chapter 8, verse 1a. We begin with um, this understanding here of the story of Stephen. And I'm just going to read the story and then highlight the different parts of this story that I would like to lift up. According to the King James Version, Acts, heard some preachers call it the good book. According to the good book, Acts, the seventh chapter, 51st verse reads, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. This comes after a speech that Stephen gives regarding the tradition of Moses and the history of the children of Israel with God. And we find that the truth of the matter is that the children of Israel are a lot like our children and a lot like us. They were not always very obedient. In fact, they were disobedient and complainers. And some other things. And so this could all be summed up as resisting the Holy Spirit. I want you to uh, wrap your mind around as I read this text, this, this notion of resisting the Holy Spirit. Resisting the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go ahead and say this right now because I don't want to forget it. Um, 
Resisting the Holy Spirit means that God told you a better way. And rather than you or I or us doing what God told us to do, we talked ourselves out of it. Oh, I won't do that now, or maybe I'll do it later, or no, I'm just not doing that. I'm going to do something else. But we know what God told us to do. One of the areas where I am beginning to be more focused about is this area of, I'm going to call it division and separation. I believe that as people who are believers and people of faith, we ought to seek to have more diverse relationships. We ought to seek to break down divisions, first in our family, in our personal life, and then in our public and our community life. We must begin to reach out to different people, people that are different than we are. Why? Well, I was thinking on yesterday as I was walking through downtown that there are some people who uh, think that um, they are, uh, just because they don't like people, that means that God doesn't like them. I'm going to put this another way. There is no black heaven. And if you think that you will only in this life have to deal with black people or the people that you like, you are sadly mistaken. When you get to heaven, those kinds of people will be there. So I would suggest you learn how to love those people now because if you get to heaven, you're going to have to love them for an eternity. And if you truly despise them or hate them, well, there's another place for you, and it's not heaven. I would hate to believe that white folk would get to heaven and find out that God is black, and they don't like black folk, and they would prefer to go to heaven because a white man is in charge, or, or hell because a white man is in charge. We need to discard this thinking of division. There is one family. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. There are no denominations in God. Religion is our hang-up. It's not God's hang-up. God is spirit and God is love. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because I didn't want to forget that as I read that text. When we resist the Holy Spirit, we say it's okay to go to an all, all one uh, ethnic church, but that's not God's way. God made everyone, and God expects that. I am glad to be pastor of the West Park Baptist Church because we have a little bit of everyone in our congregation, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, male, female. We've got them all, and I thank God for that because that means that we're doing God's work. And when the world, hear me now, when the world sees black and white unified and together, the world doesn't have an answer for that. The world simply does not. You cannot continue to enforce racist, divisionist, imperialistic, colonialistic understanding when you are dealing with a people who are united beyond race, color, class, and economics. One law is one baptism. Somebody said somewhere, one nation under God. If we ever are one nation under God, spiritually, we will be unstoppable. I'm going for power today, and I believe that Stephen goes for power here in this text. Let me uh, return to reading the text. It's a problem when you're a preacher and you read the text because the Holy Spirit starts talking, and then you, you wind up somewhere else, but God is good. Um, do not resist the Holy Spirit is what I'm trying to ask people to do. Do not resist God's pulling and unctioning upon your heart to be the best person you can be. There are some parts of the city where God needs you, but you won't go. You will not go. It always amazes me that we have missionaries that go all across the world 
to deal with the same issues of poverty to the same color of people that exist right here in their own neighborhood across town. You don't have to go over to Ethiopia or Africa or anywhere else. You can just come on down to 55th, and you can find all the people you want to help. And guess what? They will be your neighbors. Let me say this in terms of commercial. If you really want to help somebody, come on over here to the West Park Baptist Church. Right now, we've got homeless brothers and sisters who are uh, having breakfast and they're getting their haircuts and, and looking at clothes and getting rides downtown. We need people to transport homeless people back and forth. We just had that conversation. We need people to help with uh, the clothing distribution, uh, hanging up clothes, making clothes look nice, helping them find the proper uh, clothes. We need people to help serve like Stephen served in this text. We need people who are of the mind of God and who are not concerned about what people look like or what they're doing in their private lives, but they are concerned that they are children of God. If God has told you to do something other than watch football, baseball, go to the mall, and work out on Sunday mornings, maybe you ought to hear the Holy Ghost. Lord, have mercy. Don't resist the Holy Ghost. Text says your fathers did it, and you're doing the same thing. Which of the prophets have fathers persecuted? They persecuted all the prophets. Which of them have they not slain? They, they slayed all of them. Whom ye now been the betrayers and the murderers, they betrayed them, you betrayed them. Stop lying on the preacher. Stop lying on the church. Stop telling people that it's the church's fault that you're messed up. Show some accountability. Man up. Woman up. You've made bad decisions. Now it's time to fix it up. The funny thing about it is that when you know that you really want to get fixed up, you know where to come to. It's that same church that you've been lying on. It's that same preacher that you've been lying on. The same one who looked beyond your faults, found your needs, and helped you, treated you like a human Come on, church, let's stop pretending. We have a prophet here in this text called Stephen, and he's saying these very things to the people of God. 53, who have received the law by disposition of the angels and have not kept it. You got the law. The angels gave it to you. Lord, have mercy. And even when the angels gave it to you, you still didn't keep it. 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. I hope you understand that means they bit the prophet. They bit the prophet. Um, you, 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 uh, you may or may not be a fan of Bill Cosby. I know it's popular to call him a rapist now and he's been to jail and, and now you feel righteous because you can look down on Bill Cosby. But you know what, if I had a list of all of the millions of dollars he gave to black colleges, it would astound you. If I had a list of all of the ways that he used media, Fat Albert, Different World, um, so many different shows that he created to give black folks a healthy um, disposition of themselves. If I could tell you that in college, in college you shouldn't have time to read or watch TV, but on Thursday night when I was in college, everyone knew that that was the lineup. Everyone knew that they would get to see Dr. Huxtable and his wife and his children having intelligent conversation dealing with the issues of life and dealing with them effectively and with humanity and kindness and emotional intelligence. Everyone knew that and every night at about 8 o'clock it was a ghost town on my campus and that wasn't just on my campus but it was all across the country because people wanted to see Dr. Huxtable. They wanted to see Bill Cosby and I, 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 I just want you to be clear 
that uh, there was a period where Bill Cosby literally said to black parents, he said, parents, be parents. Parent your children. Discipline them. Send them to school. And I can remember as if it was yesterday, we had a barrage of black comedians, media, and so forth, who usually don't have anything to say about anything, but they all gathered to attack Dr. Bill Cosby because he was telling black parents that they were being irresponsible in many cases. And he was right. But when people hear the truth, they don't always like to hear it. They don't like to be exposed. In this particular text with Stephen, he exposes the Sanhedrin council for who they really are. They are people who have not honored God. They have not honored the prophets. They have not honored the traditions. They have only honored themselves. And as a result, they are reaping what they sow. Stephen didn't come to judge them, but he came to make them aware that God wants more from them. And at some point in this journey, all of us must stop pretending with God and acting like we don't know better when we do know better and when you know better you ought to act better you ought to make a change every single person under the hearing of my voice is a change agent every person that can hear me is a change agent the question becomes are you making the change in this world that God put you here to make and it begins by have you made a change in yourself. If you want to change the world, you must change yourself first. Stop resisting the Holy Spirit. Stop testifying on the church. Stop blaming everyone else for your faults and your failures. Stop being a victim and stand up in the power of the Holy Ghost and be an example. Be a teacher. Be a leader, be a lover, be a friend, be a good son, be a good husband, be a good brother. It is time for us to take a clear look in the mirror. Stephen is challenging the Sanhedrin Council, and it is clear that he is not concerned about his own welfare because he realizes that this must be said. I use the example of Dr. Bill Cosby because he realized that the things that he was saying must be said. They must be said. When 10% of the population is at least 50% of the homeless population, at least 50% of the jail population, we lead in every our health circumstance, we are the largest group in receiving Alzheimer's. We are the largest group that has dementia. We are the largest group in the U.S. population with cancer and AIDS and all of those issues, yet we are only 10% of the population. How can this be so? Without a vision, the people perish. Stephen was sharing the vision of God with the people of God so that they might act like the people of God. Is it okay to ask the people of God to act like the people of God, to walk like the people of God, to pray like the people of God, to live like the people of God, to think like the people of God, to speak like the people of God? Is it all right to ask the people who are made in the image of God to actually be the image of God? Is it okay Text says when they heard these things, they were cut to heart, just like so many in the black community were cut to heart when Dr. Bill Cosby said his piece. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. Oh, they gnashed on him with their teeth. When Dr. Cosby was accused, many said, that's what he gets. A lot of people like to throw around this word karma. I'm going to have to say a word about karma because most folk have no idea what karma is about. 
but they use it as if they are new wave theologians. Our Bible is clear, you reap what you sow. But don't become a theologian overnight because many times people use the word karma and its understanding to reveal and belie their own vengeance and their own evil and they are exposing themselves. Anybody heard that when you dig a grave for somebody else, you might as well dig two, or you might be digging one for yourself. Bible says that he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly unto heaven and saw the glory of God and, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. I want you to know that today, we have witnessed, and, and if you are not a black male, you, you may be calling this someone else, something else. You might be calling it justice. But today what we are witnessing right before our very eyes is a, a, a new form of lynching. And the new form of lynching does not kill the body. There was a time, I remember reading a story about W.E.B. Du Bois when he was working in Atlanta, and uh, he got word that they were chasing a black man who had been accused of looking at a white woman or something, and they were chasing him. The word spread through the community that they were chasing him. And uh, Dr. Du Bois would often try to intervene the best way he could through media and network and so forth to try to save people. Um, from the lynch mobs, but he recalls how when he was in Atlanta, teaching at Atlanta University, and he was headed over to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution because he had heard about this man who was falsely accused, but who, you know, when the lynch mob gets ready to lynch, they don't care about right and wrong. All they want is blood. And uh, when there also is mixed in there some some false superiority, like white is better than black, and all black people are guilty, and all that other garbage that's from the devil. Um, they really get empowered. But he writes about how he realized that he got to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution too late, because by the time he arrived to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, they already had the man's fingers on display at the local meat market. And what I'm trying to help us understand is that the part that we don't understand about lynching was it was about the display. It was about displaying hanging bodies from trees, whether it was women, children, or men. It was about showing black people how worthless their life was. It was about the dramatic display of hanging black men and their lifeless bodies with ropes around their necks, having been dismembered many times uh, of arms and of private parts, sometimes their tongues being taken out, sometimes their eyes being gouged out. It was about the display. And even if there's no truth, the display is what makes the day, is what makes those that feel superior uh, okay about the murder. And so uh, he realized that he was too late because the fingers of the man that he was trying to uh, uh, save were on display at the local meat market. Now some of us might say, that, that, that just seems unreal. No, no it's real yesterday and it's real today, only now with the new form of lynching, there's no need to kill the body. We kill the name. We kill the character. We kill the presentation. And for all of that work that Dr. Cosby did for all of those years, all he is being remembered now by the new generation is that he is some type of criminal. They have no idea of the history of character assassination, actual assassination, 
lynching and the connection thereof. And today we live in a society where black men in particular are being a new form lynched and assassinated, not their bodies, but their name. We find two things are happening. They destroy their name and their reputation. Hence, they destroy their earning power. And if they have earned anything, they want it back. They want it back. They want it back. I'll call three names, and, and, and we're going to move on. O.J. Simpson. His name was Golden. I remember vividly running through the airport thinking I was O.J. Simpson. Some of us are too young to remember the commercials of O.J. running through the, uh, all the airports uh, for the Hertz commercial. Some of us forget about all the orange juice uh, references with O.J. Simpson, and yet his name was muddied and sullied to the point where he could no longer earn anything and everything that they, he had, they sought to take it away. They took his trophies away, they wanted his money, they took everything. That's what's happening. The name is sullied, uh, the earning potential is limited, and what they have, they take it away. Deshaun Watson, no different. Uh, you, you check the record. Bill Cosby, no different. You check the record. And the reason why I know it's a new form of lynching is because the white male can do the same thing and not even get a slap on the hand. Did I say Brett Favre? Not even a slap on the hand. Did I say uh, Tom Brady? Not even a slap on Tom Brady has cheated in every form and fashion possible in football, yet he's the GOAT. Every single time uh, you compare Kyrie Irvin with uh, um, uh, Aaron Rodgers. Same issue, same time, different sports, totally different treatment of Kyrie, totally different treatment of Aaron Rodgers. There's a new form of lynching in town, and it's called char character assassination and robbing the black man of his ability to earn and taking what he has. That's what's going on. So... We have Stephen here being lynched, being stoned to death, and they are biting him on the back. Not only are they biting him on the back, but they are covering their ears because they do not want to hear what he has to say. He's not lying. He is, according to the text, full of the Holy Ghost, and he is telling the truth. While he is being persecuted, he says, I see the heavens open up. The Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice. The text says they stopped their ears and they ran on him in one accord. We've got to stop him. They cast him out of the city, the Bible says in the next verse, and they stoned him. Wow. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. We come back to Saul. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Stephen did, saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died, finally, and Saul was consenting unto his death. Now, we find here the story of a man of God who is lynched in a, or is, is, is murdered, stoned to death, died in a way that is very similar to the way that Jesus died. First of all, he had committed no sin. All of us know, especially black men know, that you do not have to commit a crime in order to be found guilty. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Every black man knows you do not have to commit a crime to be found guilty of that crime. Not only that, you do not have to commit a crime in order to be found guilty and punished for that crime. Not only that, every black man knows you do not have to commit a crime, but you can be found guilty of that crime, you can be punished for that crime, and they can and will take your life for that crime that you did not commit. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. I'm coming back to that at 11 o'clock. And so when you understand that, understand that Stephen no longer felt the need to focus on what this world could give him. I wish y'all could hear me. Because this world ain't giving you nothing. 
especially as a black man. This world will persecute you. This world will punish you. This world will imprison you. This world will murder you. Therefore, our reward does not have to be and cannot even be in this world. Y'all ain't hearing me. I'm going to go here. My son will stop driving my car. Y'all know what my car looks like. You know what I drive. He will stop coming back. He was two exits from this exit. And the policeman stopped him and asked him one question. What are you doing driving this expensive car? Y'all hear me? He had committed no crime. The only crime he committed in the white man's eye was he was driving a very nice car. He had his hat on and he had on a white t-shirt. And he probably had the seat back far too far. But last I checked, wearing a hat is not a crime. Even wearing a white t-shirt is not a crime. Last I checked, driving a nice car is not a crime. But he was stopped because in the policeman's mind, he committed a crime. Let me tell you how this thing unfolded. He decided to tow the car. So revelation, he showed up in an Uber. I said, where's my car? <laughs> Say, the police told it. Say, I didn't have proof of ownership. Y'all hear me? Anyway, I went and got the car, but follow my paradigm. You can be committed, you can be accused of a crime and found guilty, even though you have committed no crime as a black man. Huh? You can be punished. They punished him. That, 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 that state patrol decided when he saw my boy driving by, he was taking that car. He was going to find a way to take that car. So he punished him for having a hat on, white t-shirt, driving a nice car, which is not a crime. Amen? And I guess if he had an excuse, he probably would have tried to take his life. Y'all hear me? But it was two people in the car, so he had a witness. It's funny how folk can halfway act right when they are being watched. Y'all not hearing me. We went and got the car, and so I used this as a learning opportunity for my son. I said, understand where we live. We live in the United States of America, and we are black men. And I don't care how many white friends you have, you will never be white. And they will never accept you as being white. I know that doesn't sound nice, but I'm just dealing with what I've been dealing with for the last 55 years. And I ain't going to lie to myself, and I'm certainly not going to lie to you. I've been to the best schools. I've traveled the world. I've sat with the PhDs. I've been to the White House and the Crack House. I've been everywhere a black man can go, and the Lord has blessed me every step along the way. And every step along the way, I find that when you are lynched in the new form, they will not only punish you, they will not only give you a, a false guilty, but they will also try to take back what you have. That's just the way it goes. And so with that, I use that as an opportunity to tell my son, wake up, wake up, wake up. And I'm trying to tell you, wake up. We are in this world, but we are not of it. And we are persecuted often just because of the color of our skin. My son is 6'4", probably got, you know, 1% body weight. He's intelligent. And that's a problem for some people. Y'all better hear me. So, having said all that, Stephen finds himself uh, in the midst of this persecution. And as he is persecuted, I want to use this text to show us how while we are being hurt, this is serious, 
while we are being hurt, God can heal us. Our situations as black people in America has not been pleasant. There are a lot of unpleasantries. We've had to suffer second class citizenship. We've had to suffer legal persecution. We've had to suffer physical persecution, dogs, bombs, disease, water hoses, fire, crosses, harassment, humiliation, beatings. We've been through it all. And now we're no longer getting those kinds of treatments publicly because they still do it in prisons and behind doors and when the police can stop you and they don't think nobody's looking. But now we have to deal with psychological warfare where we are being conv convinced that somehow even though the law says everyone is created equal and all things are equal and we are in a free country, we know there are some neighborhoods we still can't go to and be comfortable. There are some restaurants we can't go to and be comfortable. There's a lot of things that we can do today and be comfortable because there is a psychological warfare going on. You don't have to hang up signs anymore saying whites only. You know that it's whites only. You know that blacks are not allow. And as a result, it begins to affect your psyche and your self-esteem. And when anything affects your psyche and your self-esteem, it becomes a problem for who you are and who you need to be. You're being hurt. There is a dis-ease and a violence going on in your spirit, according to Howard Thurman. And as a result, we have to find a way to find peace, even though we are in the midst of a psychological and spiritual a war. So the text says that God opened up heaven and God allowed for Stephen to see heaven, to see Jesus sitting on the right hand of God the Father. God gave him healing amidst the world trying to hurt him. I hate to say this to some people because they've really bought into the system, but the world is not going to give you your blessing. Your blessing will not come from the world. If you manage your resources, then you can use your resources to bless you and your family. But the world, I'm going to put it in plain English, Ebonic English, the world ain't giving you nothing. The world ain't giving you nothing. And if you don't figure out who you are, whose you are, especially as a black person in America, you are bound to be a beggar and to be some other things that you don't want to be. Sick in health, in mind, in heart, in spirit, always a victim, always asking somebody to come fix your problems. The world ain't giving you Nothing. And God didn't fix it so that the world has to give you anything. God fixed it so that you can provide everything that you need for yourself and your family. But in order to do that, you have to get your mind right. This text is one of those texts which speaks to the mind of Stephen. Stephen was being persecuted. Stephen was being treated like a second-class citizen, as if he had done something wrong. He was accused, though he was innocent. He was punished, though he had made, but made no crime. And he was going to have to give up his life, all because folk didn't like what he was saying. And what he was saying was the truth. Sound like a black man to me. And so with that, the question becomes, what do we do? What does God make available to help us get through this life, these trials, this persecution, this unfairness, this racism, this poverty, this disease, this imprisonment, this, 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 this uh, police brutality, this uh, thing where we can't get along in relationships? What does God give us? In this case, God gave Stephen a glimpse of heaven. In other words, God said, there's something better. There's something a lot better than what you're going through. And all I need for you to do in that world, in that life, 
is find out who you really are. Become self-aware of who you really are so that you can be ready for the next part of the journey. This is not the whole journey. This is, according to John Wesley, a flash in the pan. Your life is a flash in the pan in, in the terms of the universe. You're here for, for a flash in the pan, but within that flash in the pan, I submit that you must learn how to love somebody. You must learn how to to be loved. Otherwise, life has no meaning. We must learn the lesson of unconditional love. And unconditional means no conditions. No conditions. You can't love because. You can't love if. You can't love when. You can't love uh, if you do that and if you do that. You just got to love and love hurts. But if you learn how to love, this text says you can learn how to be healed no matter what somebody does to you. You can learn how to be whole and in your right mind no matter what they say about you, no matter how many lies they tell you, no matter how uh, brutal they are. They can even take your body, but you still can be healed. That doesn't make sense to some folk, I know, because your mind is stuck in the physical, but in terms of the reality, our real existence is in the spirit, and the God is spirit. I like to believe that God is a great mind, and he gave us a mind like his, and when we think like God, we're acting on God's behalf, and some of us need to adopt an understanding that we are acting like God when we use our mind to solve the challenges of this life. God wants us to have better. I said this already this morning, and so with that, I want us to see how God allows for the world to think that they are tearing Stephen down, that they are winning, but all they're doing is helping God's cause because God learned and is teaching us in this text how he heals us despite the challenges of our life. Do to me what you want to. I belong to God. And God belongs to me. I will not let your bitterness become my bitterness. I will not let your hate become my hate. I will not let your division and your greed become my greed. I will not assimilate into your world because I am not of this world. My father is rich in houses and in land. To his kingdom there is no end. I know who I belong to. I do not belong to you nor your God. I belong to my God. God of Abraham, Isaac, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The God of Paul. The God of all those prophets, major and minor. The God of John the revelator. I belong to that God. That's my God. The way, the truth, and the life. Somewhere along the journey, you will begin to know yourself. I joked this morning, watching myself in the monitor, and I could only see the back of my head, and I said, man, where did all that gray hair come from? I was just 14 yesterday. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm grown up. In fact, when I look in the mirror, all I see is my daddy. And it's amazing. But when you look into the mirror, you ought to see that you have grown and that you have matured. And when you were a child, you thought like a child, but now that you're a man, you put childish things away. Now that you are a woman, you have put childish things away. We must learn how to increase. I don't know why I said this last week, but I saw a special. I don't even know why I was watching it, but I watched a special about a man who has built a business, a very significant business in Tennessee, I believe it was, but he has never in his life ate anything that he didn't grow. I thought that was a great concept. He had all kind of bacon on the grill. He had potatoes. He had... Uh, they had sausage gravy, they had cornbread, 
He grew the wheat. He raised the pigs. Everything that they had on the table, he, he and his family grew, and they sold some. What a great concept. That's not a new concept. That's how everybody are, are, are used to live. But we've gotten so far away from knowing our gifts and our talents and our abilities that we have become beggars. That is not God's way. Stephen in this text encounters a young man named Saul. The text says that he doesn't have any conversation with Saul, but when he was being stoned, Saul holds the coats of those who are stoning Stephen. In fact, the text says that Saul consents to the stoning of Stephen. That may seem very uh, condemning. But you never know how God is working with somebody's heart. If you ever really want to figure out how God works, I believe sometimes mysteriously with our hearts. As one of my professors says he works in between our risings and our fallings, but God never gives up on us because he has unconditional love. I want us to realize today that uh, God is always trying to pull the best out of us. He's always trying to find a way to bring the best out because he only operates in the best. And so God in this mysterious way works with us. Thank God he works with us. He, he gives us grace. He gives us mercy. He works with us. He knows that we're not right all the time, but he still works with us. And thank God God never gives up on us. And now I'm, I'm trying to say don't give up on yourself. God won't give up on you. You must be something worth something special. Don't give up on yourself. As a final note, um, I want us to understand today the power of healing. And healing in a very simple definition is forgiving yourself. You will be sick as long as you declare I am sick. Now think about that. But if you ever declare one day I am well, and by his stripes I am healed, you will begin to see a difference not only in your mind, but in your body and in your wellness. If you live in wellness, if you speak wellness, if you believe wellness, God will give you wellness. If you speak sickness, if you speak hurt, if you speak pain, if you speak disease, if you accept disease, you embrace disease, you honor disease, you worship disease, well, God will give you disease. In fact, you don't even need God for that. You have given it to yourself. I'm asking us in a funny way today to know yourself, and in a funny way, Stephen is not at all affected by the persecution that is being heaped on his life because he knows himself. I think that in their own way, they would try to tell Stephen, man, will you just shut up? You keep preaching, and we keep heaping this, this persecution on you, but you won't stop preaching. Just shut up. And Stephen is saying, no, no, because the more you do, the more I glorify God. The more you do, the more you realize you can't do. Your will is not the ultimate will here, but God's will is the ultimate will here. And Stephen realized in a moment, several moments, that it was better to please God than it was to please man. And it brought him peace. It brought him healing. It brought him joy. It brought him to the point where he said, Lord, please forgive them. Don't lay this charge on them. They don't have any idea what they're doing. That is the benefit of being in the church and being in the word and learning how to pray. You are self-aware and you know what you're doing. You realize what you're doing. You have a purpose for what you're doing. I am amazed even now, even now. I'm watching them return from downtown, having taking breakfasts downtown. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Why would they take time out of their schedule, their time, their day, to take breakfast downtown? Well, it's simple, and I'm stopping. When you reach the point of your life 
where you can love somebody other than yourself and you can be a human when you are human to other humans regardless of their state it makes you feel more alive it makes you feel like you're doing the will of god i believe that the worst disease in this world is not cancer is not aids it's not even poverty and i think that's pretty high up there the worst disease i believe that humanity has is the disease of selfishness selfish and when you're selfish you block your blessing and when you block your blessing, you become your own worst enemy. Stephen gave it all. He gave it all. He served the meals. He preached. He taught. He forgot about his own life. He had the nerve to tell the truth to the Sanhedrin council. And even while they were biting him on the back and preparing to stone him, he still prayed for them. There's a word that we, we, I'm sure, don't understand, but the word is finished. And when you've done your best in this life, you're finished. And rarely do people do their best. Stephen did not complain at all about the prospect of losing his life on this day because he was finished. He had given it all. I want to say to somebody, and I don't know who I'm talking to, but if in this life you don't find something that you're willing to give it all for, you've never lived. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him all. To thee I freely give. Any of y'all heard that? I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. May God bless you. May God keep you. May his countenance shine upon you. Be self-aware. Be blessed. Be a lover and not a fighter. Amen.